Should we talk about warrants? started as a bonus track for the full-length album and it was a cassette only bonus track and this was mostly just like a logistical thing the the cassette 60 minutes I had about 52 53 minutes worth of audio which would mean that on the back end of side B there'd be a blank space and I didn't like the idea of that at all. I thought back, I guess, to a lot of my favorite albums that I really enjoyed growing up, and most of them had bonus tracks, presumably for a similar reason. They had a bit of blank space at the end that they needed to fill up, and they didn't know what to fill it with. And many of them filled it with kind of joke tracks. I mean, I think about like Korn albums that I really liked, like Follow the Leader, uh, and their track listing on that was, was really interesting, and there was a bonus track at the end of it. System of a Down's Toxicity also had a bonus track at the end. So it made sense for me to do something similar and fill that space with something. And the cool thing about a bonus track is that you can do pretty much whatever you want. It doesn't have to fit into the story of the record necessarily. It can be something a bit different. I take a lot of inspiration from video games. And I couldn't think about the idea of a secret track without thinking about the idea of a secret level. There's an amazing moment in one of my favorite games of all time, which was Doom. The original Doom from 1993. And the third episode of Doom has a secret level in it. But there's something really memorable about this secret level and what the game designers did back then, I still think about now. It's just this cool kind of gotcha moment. I love it. You access a secret level by going through a secret exit in one of the levels in the game. And when you get to the secret level, it looks just like the first level in that episode. I've done this before, the game's broken. Like, I went through this exit and I'm back at the first level. Have I lost all of my progress? What's the deal? And bear in mind I was, what, six or seven years old when I was playing this for the first time. And it was on a, you know, a, an ancient PC and stuff like that, your game breaking, was pretty possible. So you really do think, oh, I, like I've lost all my progress and I'm back at the start of this episode. What a bummer. But things are not quite the way they seem. Some of the textures on the walls are a bit different, the pictures are a little bit different, the, the colours of the floor are slightly different. But in every other way, it's the same level as the first one, until you get to the end. And you're about to hit the button and get out of there. And the moment you do so, the walls come down, everything's different, and you're ambushed, and it's a big gotcha moment. And you face off against an enemy that you haven't faced off against before this huge, terrifying, scary enemy. And I loved that. I loved that experience of playing through that level, thinking that something was wrong and it flips it on its head and just completely catches you out. And I'll never forget that experience. That bonus level is called Warrens. So it got me thinking about what is a Warren? And I wanted to write something lyrically that kind of fit in with that concept of maybe a rabbit hole. Maybe a warren was a bit of a labyrinth of the mind. The rabbit hole was in here somewhere. Instead of it being a dark and scary place that you want to escape from, it's actually somewhere really comfortable. And I ended up writing the song lyrically about this idea of digging deeper into a darker state of mind because it's where you're most at home. But in some way, I guess, it was kind of set within this, this moment of being caught out by Doom in 1993. The production of the track's quite interesting. I set up a drum kit here in the studio, and I guess you could call it a bit of a prepared drum kit. It was covered in all sorts of stuff. I had like a bag of uh, like plastic plumbing gaskets on the floor tom, and I put a little splash cymbal on top of it, and that ended up kind of being like a trashy hi-hat sound. bag of 
plasterboard screws on the snare drum. Um, and it was just a really kind of interesting, unusual drum sound. And I started with that. I kind of started with, with recording drums in that way and then building the, the sound of the track from there. It was nice to be able to, I guess, indulge myself a bit more in a bit more of an open instrumental. And that's what's cool about it being a bonus track. You know, being able to take that time and do a longer instrumental passage that, that isn't necessarily designed with it being a single in mind. It did end up being the title track of the new EP. The guitars were also, they were recorded with my old custom Telecaster, which hasn't really been out of its case since Midgar was last on tour in 2012. It's even got the same strings on it as when we played at the garage in Islington within me in December 2012. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't record the rest of the album with it, but I wanted it to feel, I guess, maybe that that, that guitar had made it an appearance. And um, it was a bit of a throwback to those times. Yeah. So the guitars are kind of dirty and scratchy sounding. and. I normally restring for every single song, uh, but those strings were, yeah, nine years old. <laughs> so I had some trouble with the electrics and the guitar, and there was a really nasty earth buzz going on. And It wasn't easy to get the kind of tones I wanted, but I guess there was a bit of a romantic side to me that wanted to record with that guitar. I have since tidied it up, but I wanted to round out this album recording with some sort of tangible relationship with the past. The three other tracks on the EP are, there's a remix of Nemesis done by Ollie Wiseman, which is super cool. He produced that during lockdown earlier on in 2021. There are two acoustic orchestral arrangements of album tracks, We Don't Make the Rules and Isle of Glass. And I guess th these songs lend themselves to that because there's a lot of orchestral elements going on in those songs anyway. Isle of Glass particularly, I wanted to give a, a different spin because it's, it's a love song and I wanted to put out a version that was a little bit softer and gentler and sweeter sounding than the version on the album. So this is the end of, of this album cycle. I can't really believe it, to be honest. <laughs> it's all out there, you know. It's, it's pretty much two years on the nail since I first started recording the album. and Just over two years, actually, since I built the studio to, to do the work in. So it, it's been a huge journey from literally building the walls of the space and, you know, putting the electrics in and, and, and building the studio with my own hands and then getting in and recording it. It was really cool to to round this campaign out with a bit more of a high production value music video. All of the others were just totally DIY and they were done within the, the kind of confines and restrictions of, of a lockdown environment. This one we were able to actually go and do all the stuff that we dreamed about doing through this album campaign. So yeah, this, this video with Warren's was much more ambitious and um, I'm really, really proud of how it came out and I'm really glad to be able to give this album cycle the send-off that it deserves. I don't know what's next. We'll see. I'm always writing stuff. I don't think it's going to be another eight or nine years <laughs> until the next one. I guess I was able with this album to say a lot of the things that I wish I'd been able to say when I was younger but didn't know how. This feels pretty definitive to me, this album. It feels like I've achieved what I set out to with Midgar. 
it just took me a really long time to find the skills to be able to do that. So I don't know what's next. <laughs> we'll see.